Maserati Gran Cabrio, the convertible version of the Gran Turismo, a grand tourer through and through. I think the questions surrounding this car and kind of Maserati as a whole has always been why? There are more powerful Grand Tourers on sale, there are less expensive Grand Tourers on sale, so why are you going for this Grand Cabrio, or its coupe brother, the Gran Turismo? I think historically the answer has always been soul. Those indescribable feelings you get when just looking at the car or driving it. And a car's soul is nothing if not its engine. Historically, for a Maserati Gran Turismo or Gran Cabrio, that has meant a Ferrari-sourced V8. So the soul of the vehicle pulling you in the Maserati direction away from, say, the Bentleys, the Aston Martins of the world, makes a little bit of sense. However, in this new generation, this all-new 2024 Maserati Gran Cabrio, we no longer have a Ferrari-sourced V8. Under the hood of all Grand Cabrios that are gas-powered is a 3.0-liter twin-turbo V6 that in its most powerful output, which this Trofeo version is, produces 542 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque. There will also be an all-electric Maserati Grand Cabrio called the Fulgare that makes over 700 horsepower. So today we're going to take a look at this new Grand Cabrio and see how Maserati intends to woo buyers in this new twin-turbo V6 era. A Grand Tourer is meant to be the ultimate vehicle to explore the world. In, at least the paved world. So the looks of the vehicle are quite important. The car needs to pull you in, enticing you to just get behind the wheel and drive. And certainly this 2024 Maserati Gran Cabrio achieves that. The last generation vehicle was a beautiful car, and this new one looks much the same, if just a little more rounded and modern. Now this is, I believe, an objectively beautiful car, and I'm not trying to discount that, but the rear end does fall a bit flat for me. I love the exhaust and the rear diffuser, but this upper section is a tad vanilla. It kind of reminds me of like a 2005 Chrysler Sebring, which is not a compliment, and I don't mean to liken these two cars, but I can't help but remember their shared parentage, as Chrysler is a, a parent company to Maserati now in this new Stellantis family of brands. This is definitely a more beautiful car, but the general shapes and stuff, they just remind me of that. I think Maserati could have done a bit more with this rear end in terms of the looks. Popping under the hood, we can see this car's soul, the new 3.0-liter twin-turbo V6, again making 542 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque. I like this engine, but I don't love it. It is very fast. It is very responsive. Uh, it works really well with this transmission as well. Very snappy. And some of the upshifts and downshifts are quite exciting with the exhaust. However, it just doesn't feel that special. When you are in GT mode or comfort mode, which I'll talk more about when I'm driving the car, it kind of just feels like any other V6. You aren't constantly reminded about how awesome this engine is. Last week I was driving an Audi SQ8, very different vehicle from this one, but it had a four liter twin turbo V8 making 500 horsepower. Even when that car was just idling, even when you were just accelerating in a neighborhood to 25 miles an hour, you still remembered that you were driving a V8 because of its constant rumbles and gurgles. This car doesn't really deliver. A few months ago, I got to drive the Maserati Gracale Trofeo, so their compact or subcompact uh, SUV with this same engine in it. So very fast, it was a very small vehicle. It's also a shorter vehicle, and I found the exhaust a bit more exciting in that. <laughs> I think that vehicle, uh, th they just kind of nailed the exhaust a bit more on it. This one, it's a bit more muted, a bit tamer, especially in a convertible. I would have liked a little bit more of an aggressive exhaust note because I know Maserati can do it. Now, another area that is important to the grand touring segment is practicality, because if you're going to go explore the world, you need a place to put all of your things that you're going to bring with you. And the Grand Cabrio um, is not that impressive in this category. So there is this bar here that you need to put down in order to lower the convertible top. If you fold it up, which gives you a little more height in the trunk, then the convertible top will not go down. But the whole reason you're buying this car is so that you can drop the top. So basically you're gonna have this uh, element in the entire time you own this car. And then your trunk space is laughably small. 
You see, the Lexus LC500 convertible also has a laughably small trunk, but you can actually fit two carry-on suitcases in it side by side. I was shocked when I figured that out because you can't even put a grocery bag in. That's how shallow it is. But this is even shallower than the Lexus LC500 convertible's trunk because that, ve that vehicle's trunk doesn't get any smaller when you put the top down. They've kind of done this top mechanism like it's a hard top, the way a section of the back folds up and then it comes down. It's interesting. I don't think it's the most efficient use of space in this Gran Turismo, or this Gran Cabrio, sorry. Uh, and this, uh, this back area is really small. You could fit a couple backpacks and maybe a really lightly packed duffel bag, but not much more. Luckily, there are also back seats. And the back seats of the Grand Cabrio are surprisingly versatile. You could definitely fit your carry-on suitcases back there, but if you are gonna put people back here, it also isn't that bad. This front driver's seat is adjusted to my ideal driving position. I'm six foot two. And if I climb into the car now, the seat, the bottom of the seat, automatically whirs away and you fold the top part of it manually, which is good because otherwise it would take forever. And I start letting this chair go back to my ideal driving position. I am sitting pretty upright and my shoulder is a little cramped against the side, but there's plenty of room to my right, even if there was someone sitting to my right. And look at this, my knees can completely clear the seat in front of me. That is pretty impressive. I also have an air vent, two cup holders, a USB-A, I don't know why they put that in here, and a USB-C. I'm surrounded by the excellent Sonus Faber audio system, and there is plenty of headroom. The seatbelts come from the center, and this would definitely feel like a roller coaster experience in the back of this Maserati Grand Cabrio Trofeo. And you don't have to be too scared about sitting in the back of this Grand Cabrio because should the car roll, there are explosives right behind your head that will shoot up bars to prop the car up so that your head isn't supporting the vehicle if it lands on its top. Climbing up front in this Maserati Grand Cabrio, I think this is where I am let down the most. Now the materials are all top notch. This leather is super soft, perforated, very nice to look at. There's exposed carbon fiber, some open pore wood trim. We have these amazing aluminum paddle shifters that just have the best noise when you click them and when you pull them, they are excellent. A start button on the steering wheel, all of that, good. What I don't like is the UI and just kind of the design of the IP. It's kind of bland. And if you have been in other modern Stellantis products, it's recognizable, which isn't great in a $225,000 vehicle. I was just watching a Instagram reel of the new Dodge Hornet, the instrument cluster, the exact same. The software on the infotainment system, the exact same. I'm not too peeved about software being the same, but when this vehicle, when the car that is the expensive one is so reliant on screens that it just kind of starts to feel like those cheaper vehicles, that's when it becomes an issue. And this MC, or not this MC20, this uh, Grand Cabrio is reliant on its screens. There are th four of them actually. You have this upper one, your main infotainment, a lower touchscreen for your climate controls, and then your instrument cluster, all completely digital, and all of them, none of them are very exciting. So if I turn the car on now, which again, on the steering wheel, I do like that. Oh, you can't find the key fob. It's in the back seat. Hold on. All right, engine roars to life. Another thing, the car starts in GT mode every time, which has a softer exhaust than sport mode. It's only one switch away on the steering wheel to switch it over into sport mode. Uh, I just find that a little annoying. And then you, all of your systems come to life. And I'm just not very enthusiastic about what I am greeted with. You have uh, the Stellantis infotainment system, like I said, same as the Dodge Hornet, all of your icons on the left. It's very easy to use, very clear, but they make it so much of the center of the vehicle. There isn't much going on design-wise outside of these screens. They're kind of the focus and screens aren't luxurious. Screens are gonna become dated very quickly. Screens are in every single vehicle from a, a base like Chevy Trax all the way up to this $225,000 Maserati Grand Cabrio. So that in and of itself isn't great. And all of the controls are also done either through the screens or gloss black plastic buttons, which is also just not a premium feature. There's no volume knob. I think tactile controls give automakers an opportunity to really showcase their craftsmanship because you can have really solid feeling volume knobs and very nice clicky buttons and window switches that operate very smoothly. All of that it allows automakers to demonstrate their capabilities. 
So doing everything through a screen or through gloss, gloss black buttons kind of like skips out on that and I think demonstrates a little Maserati's, uh, their inability to fully reach their ultra luxury status that they claim to be and that pop culture definitely sees them as. Uh, Cause this is not a $225,000 interior in terms of my turn signals being black plastic. All of the buttons on the steering wheel are piano black plastic and they are high gloss and very reflective. They're backlit, uh, the buttons themselves, but it's really hard to see in direct sunlight, which when you are in a convertible, you have direct sunlight a lot of the time. So I find myself having to squint to figure out what each of these buttons do. And there are a lot of them there. Uh, it's not bright enough and it's just a gloss black button is not really at home in a convertible when the top is down. Your uh, gear selectors are also gloss black push buttons. I, I really don't like that. I find myself having to press them multiple times sometimes in order to, there you go, to switch into the gear that I want. And they just don't feel nice. They feel like plastic. And the screens themselves, they're fine. Nothing to write home about. Again, not very easy to use while driving. To adjust the convertible top, you have to swipe and hold uh, the screen in order to raise it up, but I don't really want it raised right now. So I'm going to lower it again. Uh, oh, I didn't finish it. And then it raises these back quarter windows. I don't get why it does that. So let me put those down anyways. So overall, I'm just not really enthused by this interior because it is so screen heavy and I, it doesn't feel premium to me in that way. Other areas, yes, feel premium. These seats, I think like the design and where Maserati isn't focused on the screens, like over here, this dash, you have a little Italian flag. I don't actually mind the upper screen, the one that's like a clock, uh, a compass, a G meter, etc. That's fine. Um, but all of these buttons are gloss black. Even my window switches are gloss black and I can barely see them. That's not ideal. All right, driving the Maserati Gran Cabrio Trofeo. Now, unfortunately for you to be able to hear me while the car is driving, I am going to have to raise the roof. So it is a gorgeous day. I'm in Malibu, California, but I am going to have to raise the roof. And oh no, there is a truck going by. All right, on these very tight hairpin corners, you do feel the weight of this car, but that's to be expected. Again, this is a grand tour, even though this is the Trofeo, so the like most athletic version, uh, this still isn't necessarily your canyon carver, not that it can't ca carve canyons, but it is a heavier vehicle meant more for long journeys. It's, a, it's got a bit of a luxury lean, the grand touring segment, but still I am impressed by the responsiveness of this three liter twin turbo V6 uh, in sport mode. It seems very ready to give me power uh, wherever it is in the RPMs. Overall, this car remains very composed. This road was recently resurfaced, so it's pretty uh, smooth, but any dr drops or raises in the terrain, the suspension really handles with ease. Uh, that's the biggest difference I've noticed between the drive modes. Uh, the suspension definitely changes in comfort mode. It definitely gets very floaty. You still get sharp impacts into the cabin uh, because we are riding on pretty big rims. But overall, it um, it manages bumps pretty well. Uh, it's not like the most comfortable, but on these canyons, I would say it really does a good job keeping the car upright. And uh, we're not leaning that much. This is a big vehicle, but I'd say it keeps its center of gravity down low and it does a really good job keeping the car upright and handling its speed through the corners. All right, but let's, as we are stuck behind a Prius, talk about this car's uh, interior. It, again, it's not my favorite. I think it is pretty driver oriented, which is nice, like these column mounts and paddle shifters. I love the steering wheel. Um, these seats are very supportive through these twisty roads. Also very comfortable, although none of the screens are driver oriented. Huh they are quite difficult to use while driving. I was just trying to adjust my climate controls when I turned onto this canyon and that was, I decided not to because it was gonna be very dangerous because it's just pretty difficult to do while driving. That's another reason I don't love screens. They're just harder to interact with while driving. And 
In terms of the Gran Cabrio versus the Gran Turismo, uh, it stays very quiet in here when the top is up. There is great sound deadening. Uh, it's a soft top, but you really don't get that much wind noise uh, into the cabin, which I'm very impressed by. I was a little worried that you were gonna, it was gonna be a bit louder in here, but it really isn't. And I think the chassis has also remained properly rigid. There isn't really you're not losing it doesn't feel like i've we've lost that much uh chassis rigidity going from gran turismo to gran cabrio uh you just get to now enjoy the benefits of your top down driving experience which is very nice one thing i did note was that obviously it gets quite windy in here when you're going at higher speeds with the top down um and the back seat belts they seem to flap a lot i've noticed in other grand touring convertibles they normally have straps for the back seat belts to kind of hold them in place. This one doesn't have that. Uh, so they, they do kind of flap around a bit when you're going like above 50 miles an hour. Minor thing, but it is something I noticed. Also, when the top is up, your rearward visibility is pretty limited. The back window is very small. It's I've also noticed the base of it's pretty high. So I can't really see like what type of car is behind me, if that makes sense. I can't see like the grill of a car if it's more like a sedan. And my side view mirrors aren't like the biggest. It gets better when the top is down, um, but rearward visibility isn't excellent. You do have uh, blind spot monitoring and all of the other like modern safety features. So this is a very daily drivable vehicle and the engine does deliver on its performance when you are in sport mode and or Corsa mode. <clears throat> but I think when you're in GT mode, which the car automatically defaults to when you turn it on, let me switch to GT mode now. Um, and you think this is the most quintessential mode of the Grand Cabrio because this is a Grand Tour. The car, uh, it softens a lot and it feels, the engine doesn't feel as special then. Like I was mentioning with that Audi SQ8 that had the four liter twin turbo V8, you are always reminded that you had a V8. It was constantly giving you the burbles and the crackles and the snaps of a V8. This one kind of just gives V6 when you are in GT mode and you're not really pushing it. You aren't constantly reminded that this is a special engine, even though this is, has the Trofeo tuned to it, 542 horsepower. It isn't all that impressive. All right, I'm going whichever way the Prius is not. Mulholland it is. All right, we're gonna go back into sport mode and floor it and the upshifts are definitely very impressive. This car also has carbon ceramic brakes, uh, which are very good at stopping this vehicle. They are a bit squeaky, I have noticed, at lower speeds, but that's kind of to be expected. Um, like, carbon ceramics are known for being squeaky, and these are no exception. So, driving this car now down Mulholland, or up Mulholland, I'm going north. So, it's very fun to drive fast. Uh, this is a bit more of sweeping canyon bends. Wow, I haven't been over here. It is gorgeous and there's massive satellites. Um, it does a little better here. It's definitely not the most nimble car, nor is it trying to be, but I am very impressed by how responsive it is. Uh, the previous Gran Turismo I drove was the Modena, uh, so that makes a bit less horsepower in the mid 400s, I wanna say. And so you definitely notice the increased power in this Trofeo for the Gran Cabrio uh, over Modena. Uh, definitely worth it, I think. Uh, this, it's only like, this one's spec to $30,000 more than that Modena Gran Turismo I was driving, and this one is definitely more responsive, definitely more athletic. But no, as most GT cars aren't, this isn't like the most light, nimble vehicle. I would say something like, which is kind of interesting because it seems like it's more of a similar size to this. The Chevrolet Corvette, see it Corvette, feels a bit better more flat, more of a dynamic chassis around the corners. Oh, I just love those upshifts. Than this um, Gran Turismo, or Gran Cabrio, rather. Um, it, that car feels so good at high speeds around corners. It remains so planted, even though it is very big. I'm always impressed when I get behind the wheel of how well that chassis manages its power and it always feels like now I've only I've driven Stingray, E-Ray, and Z06 
uh, I've always felt like it could handle even more power. This chassis doesn't necessarily give that impression. It feels like it's pretty content with its 540 horsepower. Obviously the Fulgare is gonna have a lot more power than this, uh, but that is an EV, so it has a lot more weight down low, which would definitely help uh, with its cornering abilities. And I mean, any car can handle power in a straight line as long as it has good tires. Um, but it's really around the corners that I'm talking about. And this chassis seems like it's pretty much this is what it can handle uh, and pretty content here. But I'm not walking away from this vehicle thinking, wow, that chassis could handle more power. Again, I don't feel like there are that many uh, structural losses over Gran Turismo. That car didn't leave me feeling like it could use a lot more power either. Um, but I'm not saying it's bad. It just, this is a GT car through and through. The C8 is definitely more of a sports car than Corvette. Um, and so around the corners, you feel that a little bit, but you can definitely carry speed. Um, how is it beautiful over here? I need to come here more often. Pouring it here. Yeah, so then at the same time though, well, it definitely feels content and right at, uh, in the corners, in a straight line, it definitely could be faster. Um, it's like, it's fast, it's quick, but it's not like knock your socks off fast. And the numbers don't really give knock your socks off either. Uh, 540 horsepower, 460 pound feet of torque. Those are middling numbers in today's day and age. Like I said, the new Aston Martin Vantage makes over 650 horsepower. The new Bentley uh, Continental is also in the 600s. So, it's a good, it, it really is a good engine. Um, it's a great GT car. It gives Grand Tourer when you're driving it. I just think the V6 isn't quite at that ultra luxury level. You know, Maserati is supposed to be a step above the Mercedes, the BMWs, the Porsches of the world. I'm not necessarily getting step above in terms of the driving dynamics of this vehicle. Very good. Uh, when the top is down, it definitely feels like an exotic experience, but the engine note isn't quite there on this vehicle um, in a way that it was more there in the Gricale. I thought the engine on that one was better. The interior is a little blah, and the driving dynamics are good, but not great. So that's the 2024 Maserati Gran Cabrio. It is drop dead gorgeous, plenty fun, plenty fast, and an overall great Grand Tourer. However, there are a few things about it that I'm not that enthused by. The V6, well, very fun, very fast, isn't quite as exciting as the old Ferrari V8, and some of the interior controls are just not up to par. If not for the Maserati badges all around this vehicle, I'm not quite sure I would consider this a $225,000 car. Thanks for watching, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in my next video.